Armistice Day, 1944. France welcomes another generation of American fighting men. The brave citizens of today and their allies join in tribute to the dead of the last world war. This is Compiègne, scene of the 1918 armistice. More than any other ceremony in the land, this symbolizes the triumph of liberty over despotism. Here in historic Compiègne, America's citizen soldiers and the fighting men of France have proven themselves traditional brothers in arms. Soldiers of two generations and the people pause everywhere for two minutes of silence at 11 o'clock. The men of this war for freedom and the children revive a sacred tradition. Here at Romaine, 14,000 heroes sleep in the continent's largest cemetery. The American boys have fathers and relatives resting in the famous Meuse-Argonne burial ground beyond this chapel. For the same cause of liberty, another generation of boys are now making the supreme sacrifice. Slowly but surely, Allied troops in the Aix sector are driving forward. But autumn rains have brought a new enemy to the Western Front. Everything that goes forward now has to fight its individual struggle with the mud. Here we have a new factor in the endless battle of supply. War is not all gunfire, as these American troops have found. But up forward on that same front, on German soil, the guns are busy. There's a German concentration in that wood ahead. This is the start of the Winter War. In the south, where General Patton's troops have taken Metz, and the French have cut through to the Rhine, winter has already come. And instead of the mud, the long supply roads become sheets of ice. But still the wires have to be strung forward. The guns have to move. And although the wind bites, the trucks and the dispatch cars have to be kept serviceable. For there will be no pause in the winter war. British Air Chief Marshal Harris earns worldwide praise for the Allied triumph over the Tirpitz, opening the gate to Norway. After briefing in the cold November dawn, 29 Lancasters race along the runway. Loaded with 12,000 pound bombs, the planes climb toward the North Pole to hunt the 45,000 ton Tirpitz. For her launching back in 1939, Hitler and his aides strutted along the ship waves. Here was Nazi pomp and Nazi pride bent on war against the world. Like her sister ship, the Bismarck, this mammoth was designed to raid merchant shipping on the seven seas. She was christened by the daughter of the old admiral, Tirpitz. Heavily coated in steel, she carried eight 16-inch guns and 28 others of formidable strength. The Nazis bragged she was unsinkable. Designed for speed, she could make 30 knots at the least. But in the face of a public challenge to battle, broadcast by the SS Dakota, the famous American warship, the Tirpitz refused the challenge. 
While the Tirpitz hid in a Norwegian fjord this winter, her guns menaced any Allied offensive either by land or sea. Now, through the clouds above the north coast of Norway, the camera of an Australian Lancaster spots the Tirpitz in the Tromsø fjord. Smoke screens stream around the great battleship, but earthquake bombs drop toward the target and hit. Flak puffs dangerously around the plains. An earthquake bomb bursts on the shore, but three others hit the Tirpitz, fore, aft, and amidships. Below in Tromso Fjord, as the Tirpitz keels over, shrouded in smoke, the shadow of Nazi conquest shrinks from the north. Late in October, on the Vosges front in the west, there took place one of the heroic episodes of the war. A battalion of the 36th Texas Division had been cut off and lay trapped up forward in the hills without communications and surrounded by superior enemy forces. While a unit battled ahead to relieve them, they held on grimly day after bitter day. Medical supplies and rations were fired to them by artillery. A near miss would have been useless here. The shells had to land squarely on the target or else fall into enemy hands. It was the 442nd Infantry Division that was ordered to cut a way through to them. This was the famous and unique battalion composed of Americans of Japanese ancestry. Volunteers all. They were fighting as they had fought in Italy to prove their loyalty to their American homeland, to prove again that democracy embraces all creeds, all races. For nine days, while the Texans hung on grimly up ahead, they cut their way forward in bitter cold and in some of the toughest fighting country on the Western Front. They took prisoners, sometimes in hand-to-hand -hand fighting, and on the 10th day, they broke their way through. The lost battalion of this Second World War had been relieved. Tired men, tired to exhaustion, but unbeaten. Here are the men who fought in that trap. They came out with their wounded and with their dead. They will not forget those nine days they fought in the Vosges. Look at this man's eyes. These are the sorts of men for whom words like courage and doggedness are used by the historians. Look well at all these men. These are the sorts of men about whom legends are started. Someday they'll say, I was in the 36th, the Texans. We were up in the Vosges, and once we were cut off for nine days. And what of the troops who got through to them? The 442nd. They came out too when it was over, carrying their wounded. These too are the kinds of men about whom fine words are sometimes used. These too are Americans, and they've proved it with the full measure of their loyalty. They too fought during those nine bitter days. They too brought back their wounded. They too brought back their dead. <laughs> 